well, today this is the second in a series that we're doing on the nature of realization, uh, which, just go back, definition is always quite useful, which is to bring into existence, to make or to cause to become real. And, and I said last week, this is the season of realization. It, in the church, it's the, the season of epiphany, the celebration of the revelation of Christ to the Gentiles, the wise men and all that. And, you know, epiphany, real, revelation, is something we all want, a, a sudden intuitive perception or insight into the reality initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or occurrence, like Isaac Newton receiving the apple on his head, suddenly revelation. And it comes from the, the old Greek word meaning to reveal. And so there are t- we're talking about in this thing two aspects here. We're talking about revelation and then realization. Something's revealed to us and then we we take part in the realization, the making real of that revelation. And last week we were talking about the whispers in our heart, promises about our lives that that we think we might have heard, but we're not not too sure about. Uh, And when we hear those secret whispers, we either ignore them and tell ourselves not to believe in such silly notions, or we hear them and And we think they're never going to happen in in our lifetimes. Or we treasure them and blow on them like little flames and set them alight into reality. Those whispers that our our lives might add up to something. That we, we might get a special glimpse of eternity. That enlightenment might come to us. That, that we might make some sort of special contribution. That we might be part of something important that love might arise in our hearts, or joy, or peace, that we might see the world become a better place. Those whispers that, that we entertain, c- can we make those whispers become reality? N- not in an, in an insistent manner that says, this is my right, I will make them real, but in a humble manner that says, If these things are truly meant to be, then I will give myself. I will give myself to allowing them to happen. We have to come from the perspective that all is possible, but not necessarily probable. All is possible, but not necessarily probable. And last week we looked at the difference between those whispers and our intuition. And I did manage to get an entomology for the word intuition. And it comes from the Latin word intuary, which means to consider. So there's an element of intuiting, of, as in understanding or working out by instinct. Typically, it says fixed patterns of behavior in animals in response to certain stimuli. Birds have an instinct to build nests. I, I intuit his real identity. And so to me, the difference between Intuition and these whispers is that intuition works from within, whether quickly or or based on past experience or through a growing understanding, whereas these whispers that I speak of are almost a calling from without. They're a a part of our our relationship with the greater reality. Uh, They're a part of our relationship with the divine. They suggest that each of us has a unique relationship with everything that's out there and that the out there calls to us to take our unique place in the game of life. That's the sort of relationship I'm thinking of. And not in an insistent way, but in, it's, it's an invitational thing. They're saying, consider this. This is what your life may be asking of you. Maybe if you take this path, then the universe will conspire with you to bring about something that on your own you might not have imagined. So these whispers are an aspect of vocation or a calling from the soul of the universe to our individual souls. Come, take your place. 
Be a part of the unfolding. Make your contribution to the purposes of the divine. But I think the question is, how do we hear the voices? I was thinking, that, you know, when you say I'm hearing voices, they cart you off in, men in white coats will appear and cart you off. But how do we hear these little whispers? And once heard, how do we recognize them and tell them apart from our minds simply giving us good ideas? And then how do we reveal those whispers and realize their potential in our lives? That's what, what we're really talking about here. I, I, and for me, it's all about the stance that we take in our lives. Our relationship to this is, is about the stance that we take. We have to firmly position ourselves in such a way that we can see the bigger picture in life and yet remain rooted in the reality of our lives. You know, most of the time we're just swept along by the flow of ideas that, that appear in our minds. You know, do this, get that, react to that, don't let them tell you what to do, ignore this, pay attention to that. Our minds are constantly creating a flow that we go along with. And as we grow up, we become accustomed to listening to our minds as they guide us into a place of survival. And in the growing up, it's that flow that we have happen. Richard Raw says there are two halves to our lives. The first half is when we build the container that's going to take us through life. The beginning of all the way through in the, as we're growing up, we build the container that's going to take us through life. And the second half can describe the contents that we're going to put in that container. Uh, and this is this, this time when we discover the meaning behind what we did in the first half of our lives. It, it's about that meaning in our lives. This part isn't about growing up, but Richard Raw calls it about growing down. In growing down, we learn the lessons of surrender and letting go. In his book, Falling Upward, he says that the first half of life is about building identity, and the second half of life is about spiritual awakening. And Carl Jung once said that the first half of life is devoted to forming a healthy ego, and the second half of life is going inward and letting go of that ego. And this listening for the whispers and acting on them is definitely a second half of life activity. We built the container with the help of our minds, and now the heart can come into its own and allow that meaning to come through. This is the time we take up a stance that will serve the greater whole. And, and for me, that stance, when I was thinking about that, it's the analogy that I had, it, it's a bit like standing on a bridge. We stand on the bridge with, with the outer world before us and our inner world behind us. And we're very much in the bridge between the outer world and the inner world. And our aliveness is what gives us the perspective. We, we are alive to what's happening in the outer world and we are alive to what's happening in the inner world. And if you like, the water flowing under the bridge is our breath, it, it is, is that which keeps us constantly present and feeds us. And through the inner and the outer, that water is flowing in both directions. And while we're aware of the flowing water beneath us, while we're aware of our breath, we're not sucked into a fascination with the outer world, nor are we consumed by our inner world. We are, we are on the cusp of the two. And that standing on the bridge is being in the cusp between the inner world and the outer world, aware of both, in the moment with both. Being fully alive is being present to that present moment that contains both worlds, the within and the without, the flow of life beneath us, the water representing our breath. And in being in that moment on the bridge, we stand and perceive what's really going on. We're aware of all that's outside us, the rocks, the trees, 
the people, the buildings, the world, the cosmos. Everything is there. And then within us, our feelings, our thoughts, our memories, the container that our mind has constructed. And we're aware that all of this is eternally linked by the one consciousness that contains all things. The kingdom of heaven is within us, Jesus said. That that is the container that contains all things. The Tao of Lao Tzu, the eternal self of the Hindus, the one self of the Buddhists. And what links us to all this is to stand on that bridge in our breath, the river flowing beneath us and the waters of both the kingdom within and the kingdom without. And I think the realisation of this stance is, is what Jung and Richard Rohr are talking about when they speak about the contents of the second half of life. Being fully alive is the realisation of that stance. It is to take responsibility that our lives have meaning in the flow between the inner and the outer. And to realise that we only have a short time to make the most of that awareness. All of us just have that short time of being alive. And as we get older, we realise how short a time there is to make the most of that, that aliveness. And that aliveness is, is not there when we're dead. And therefore it goes without saying that the only time we have to make a difference is this time of being alive. And yet many people are not fully alive. They're merely carried along in the stream of their thoughts and feelings, never climbing out of that flow onto the bridge where they can truly appreciate what it means to be alive. I think all of us here are in that place. All of us here are standing on that bridge. And we all know what this is about. Everything that is said by all the gurus, in all the books that write about it, in all the scriptures that talk about it, are saying the same thing. Get on the bridge and be part of the bigger picture. Get out of that flow and just watch it. And it's when we're on the bridge, looking out, aware of the within and linked to our breath, that's when we hear the whispers. That's when we start to see the possibilities. They come on the flow of the breath. They speak to us gently in our hearts. I'm always struck in the Lord's Prayer, you know, may your kingdom come. May your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. There we are. The, again, that's the, the bridge, heaven and earth. Give us this day our bread from above that gives our whole life meaning. It's the asking for that whispering. Heaven and earth, the inner and the outer. Come and guide us. Come and make heaven in our earth. Show us what we need to do to fulfill the purposes. It's an invitation to stand on the bridge. And again, the prayer I used at the beginning, that colic for purity, they, they, it has these words. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit <clears throat> that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. That is, again, a statement of being on the bridge. To perfectly love you is to totally accept the circumstances of our lives, to hold the outer as being a gift, and then to worthily magnify your holy name means may I represent that divine within me and meet the outer with the, the best of the inner. May I perfectly love you hold it, and worthily magnify your holy name. May I be the breath of the divine while I'm standing on that bridge. May we see clearly so that we perfectly welcome what comes our way and our response is worthy of the divine nature. And again, that bridge between what we receive from life and the way we respond to it. And our job in life, I think, is to remain on that bridge. I think, I think it's interesting when you look at it that the, you know, you've got the, the, the also the nautical, t nautical term of the bridge on the ship. It's a raised place where the captain stood between the helmsman who steered the ship and everything else, including the sails, the horizon, so he could navigate. The captain is on the bridge, 
like we're on the bridge. We have to take that stance. Uh, and you know, to get, put the ship analogy, too often we, we stay in our cabins hoping that, the, that life will take us to the destination that we want to go to. Or we fight the wind. You know, we either stay in our cabin and just hope we get there. Or on the other hand, we fight the wind and the tides to force our way through to a destination that we've thought up rather than reading the circumstances and, and being the captain of the ship. And so in our lives, we, we may occasionally take a stance on our bridge, maybe in meditation or in some crucial moment. You know, we, we consciously do that sometimes. But most of the times... We're content to sit on the bank and watch the river flow by or get into the river and let, it, let ourselves be taken along by it. But I think our role is to take that stance on that bridge at all times, to listen for the whispers, to connect the inner and the outer and to navigate a course that's made evident to us when we hear what's being revealed to us and we bring that to a point of realisation. If we're not on the bridge, then we'll not hear the whispers, that calling to our souls. Nor will we be able to recognize the potential of whatever's going on. Each of us is on that bridge now. We come together in a space like this to remind ourselves of it. We are conscious now of the inner and the outer. We're conscious of the river of life in our breath. So now is the time that we can hear. Now is the time that life can reveal to us our path. And now is the time where we can realize the direction of that path. And we just have to remember that and keep that as we go through our lives and not just leave it at the door of the sanctuary, but remind ourselves as we go through and then hear what needs to be realized. So revelation and realization, I just think these are two riveting words. Um, revelation, obviously, that which is being revealed, and realization, that which we come to know to be true, that which is true and which we might embody or bring into manifestation and actuality. And the fact is that things are always being offered to us that it's in the very nature of the divine heart to give away and to reveal, to uncover, to make known and to be known, like that old Sufi saying that says of God, I was a hidden treasure, God, you know, God, I was a hidden treasure and longed to be known. So I created a creation to which I made myself known. Then they knew me. So our daily lives are filled to the brim, really, with opportunities to hear, to receive revelations, and to turn those revelations into realizations. The only issue is that we often just don't have ears to hear. Our senses are just somewhat dulled, or we're not alert. We're not tuned in. Or maybe we just don't care enough, or at least some part of us doesn't care enough. And we're not committed enough. Often we're coasting or maybe even surviving rather than being at the creative cusp of making the divine manifest, of participating with that divine heart whose very nature is to manifest, to make known that which is real. It's so curious to me, like, why is it that just as we all have that innate longing and yearning to know the divine, and to be met and fulfilled, it's as if somehow we're just not up to the task. We're too clouded or too content to live in murky waters rather than, rather than to do what it takes to have clear waters that can receive and reflect the divine image or that can simply hear the kind of whisperings that, that Nicholas has been talking about. All of this reminds me of Jim Finley who who was here at the, as part of the speaker program last year, who talks about cultivating that inner stance, cultivating an inner stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken by beauty, by love, whatever. Cultivating an inner stance 
that offers the least resistance to hearing divine whisperings. So I'm going to read a bit from Jim Finley, and I literally, I, I can't cut this. I just, I'm going to read a page, and it's so amazing. This has become total treasure in my life. So see what we glean from this. So he's, he's talking about non-dual consciousness, that we approach non-dual consciousness by means of our contemplative experience. To contemplate means to observe carefully, to pay attention. Throughout the day, things catch our eye and we momentarily contemplate them. In the quietness of the sustained, attentive gaze, we recognize a preciousness, an immediate worth or value for which no words can do justice. And we sense this is so because the worth or value is God's presence pouring itself out and giving itself away in and as the gift and miracle in whatever it is that's captured our attention. Furthermore, we recognize ourselves to be one with this intimately realized experience of God pouring itself out in and as the gift and miracle of our life. Let's say, for example, hang on, I'm just going to have a sip of water, bear with me. <laughs> Let's say, for example, that you go out and do some gardening. You begin in dualistic consciousness, trying to get some things done. But while you're working, in your deepening attentiveness to the earth, you are graced with a felt sense of oneness with the preciousness of the earth and the gift of life. This attentiveness brings you an experience of oneness with the earth, which in turn gives rise to a sense of your own preciousness in your oneness with that life all around you. This experience is true for all of us, we each have a taste of non-dual consciousness from time to time. The face of our beloved, a child at play, the sound of running water, the intimacy of darkness in the middle of a sleepless night. Our lives move in and out of non-dual consciousness. In these moments, we intuitively use the word God, maybe for the infinity of the primordial preciousness that we in such moments realize ourselves to be one with. In these moments we realize that nothing is missing anywhere and what fools we are to worry so. As I reflect on this, and this is still Jim talking, it dawns on me that the root of sorrow is my estrangement from the intimately realized oneness and preciousness of all things. I'm skimming over the surface of the depths of my life. Yet, I know in my heart that the God-given, godly nature of every breath and heartbeat is hidden in the ever-present depths over which I am skimming in my preoccupations with the day's demands. So the question becomes, how can I learn to not play the cynic, to not break faith with my awakened heart? In my most childlike hour, I have tasted the presence of God that is perpetually manifesting and giving itself to me as my very life. While the value of my life is not dependent upon the degree to which I realize this unitive mystery that's always there, the experiential quality of my life is profoundly related to the degree to which I'm learning to live in habitual awareness of and fidelity to that God-given, godly nature of the life that I'm living. I cannot make moments of non-dual consciousness happen. I can only assume the inner stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken by the grace of non-dual consciousness. Two lovers cannot make moments of oceanic oneness happen, but together they can assume the inner stance that allows them to be overtaken by the oceanic oneness that blesses their life. 
My spiritual practice, says Jim, is to sit each day in childlike sincerity with an inner stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken by the God-given, godly nature of myself, just the way I am. I mean, this, this, is, this is amazing. This is, it's so simple. So I'm just going to pose some questions. To what extent are you skimming over the circumference of your life? Skimming over the depths that you've glimpsed? It's so tender. And even as we sit here now, can you find, can you experience a sense of a certain quietness in you? Or do you feel murky waters? Like, what is your sense of your inner um, atmosphere? In your quietest moments in your life, are you aware of a niggling thought or invitation, a whispering, that when you're quiet enough, that you can hear? Or is there some such whispering that Perhaps you had years ago, decades ago, but that's become buried or dormant amidst the hustle and bustle of your life. Or perhaps a hunch about something that your rational mind has dismissed. Maybe something you put on hold years ago, saying to yourself that you'd pick it up again one day. Is there a whispering that you could re-engage with, that you could start a conversation with. If you're aware of such a niggling or intuition or whispering, what might it require of you? Maybe a willingness to consent. Maybe the courage to gently face into something. Or if nothing comes to mind, maybe nothing comes to mind, then maybe it's just that we might ask that we might be open and available to whatever might be wanting to come through our one wild, precious life, as Mary Oliver put it. What is wanting to come forth through your life? What's wanting to be expressed and manifest through you, your particularity? What form of love or beauty or kindness or artistry or action is wanting to come through you? What might be your and my and our contribution to the unfolding of love, the unfolding of the world? So really, let's all make sure that we're listening for that still, small, humble, gentle, uninsistent voice of the divine. So uninsistent. So kind. How might we connect the inner with the outer? And as Nicola said, navigate a course that is made evident to us as we hear what's revealed to us and bring it to a point of realization. You and I and all of us and the world, you know, will be richer for it. So I just uh, wondered if anyone want to chime into the conversation at all. Um, Heather's got a microphone and uh, just an opportunity if anyone does want to say anything. If not, Bruce, yeah. Great message. My bridgemanship has just been nudged up. Um, it occurred to me that, that at, through your, your, your talk that there are a lot of like Isaac Newton and the Apple, there are wonderful stories of, of inventors, you know, for Fleming discovering penicillin, <clears throat> and his, his quote was, a, 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 you know, fortune favors the prepared mind, or Archimedes with Eureka. In those cases, there could have been enormous amount of noise, but they, they did have sort of a North Star or a focus that they were very focused on. I, I reflect today that 
both the noise and the signals have exploded. You yeah. know, the, just the, the noise, thanks to interconnected digital 24 seven, et cetera, social media, but also at the same time, never have there been more information, tools, videos, you name it, to learn how to do whatever you wanna be. And uh, so, the, some, a lot of people were overwhelmed with their, their personal possibilities or their p potential North Stars, but then there's all this other stuff saying, no, this is what you should be doing. You know, if you don't have this, you're not, you're not cool kind of thing. So, how, what are the tools I guess mindfulness to try to sort of just quiet and get some sort of focus. But I do think you, you do need to sort of settle on some sort of North Star or focus that allows you to you know, hear the right whispers and, and run with them. Do you want to say, talk to that? Well, I just, I just think that it's so personal and so unique to each one of us. Like, there are a million answers to that question and that, um, the, the task is to really discern what it is that brings you joy and life and openness of heart and clarity of thinking, whatever it is that's beautiful to you, to give yourself to that habitually and to return and return and return to that which takes you to the deeper place. And that is, you know, it's different for each of us. Yeah. yeah. What about you? I mean, uh, I really resonate, and I'm sure all of us do, with the amount of noise that comes our way. You know, just in a conversation, how many times do we look at our phone during a conversation? You know, we, we were talking as a family the other day, an email came in, and my attention went whoom to the email, and suddenly I just wasn't present in that, in that conversation. And I think we just have to be aware of that. And, and aware of, of, of being prone. But also, I, I notice so often that I, I forget to, to, to maintain my place on that bridge. You know, when I go out, and the moment I start talking to someone, part of me just lets go of my willingness to be completely present in heart and in mind with the conversation I'm having with that person. And I think we really have to remind ourselves uh, that this is a minute-by-minute minute work. It's not, you know, a, a, a once uh, on a Sunday or it's not once a day. You know, we forget all the time. The moment we forget, then we start, you know, f falling. Uh, and then we remember and we bring it. And it's not desperate. You know, it doesn't have terrible consequences. But I think the, the willingness to stay in that place on a 24-7 basis is an important thing. Uh, to, to remind ourselves to keep our place on that bridge. Anybody else? Yes, Camille and then Ward. Oh. <laughs> um, I think on the bridge is the present moment. Yeah. Which is why I recommended A New Earth to you last night for your new book yeah. club. This phone thing and all the noise and all that, people don't stay in the present moment, present with another person's sacredness, and it's insulting. Yeah. And it, it's very degrading for our lives. So. Thanks, Camille. I think it, it is the present moment. You're absolutely right. Right on the top of that bridge. That bridge, it is the present moment. Yes, you know, take that hand, our true home is the present moment. Yeah, Ward. I'll see if I can put this in words. Um, when, when you were talking, I was thinking about the spirit of Aston. <coughs> Excuse me, that uh, there's material world, there's <coughs> uh, the downtown, all the glitz, the glamour, uh, the private jets. Um, that, for me, is the discovery part, the, the, to build the container. That's, that's the distraction. That's, um, What we really should be aiming for, and in, in Bruce's uh, term, the North Star, is the North Star is the spirit of Aspen, the fabric of our community that is the, the bridge between what is the concrete material, the glitz and glamour, and what really makes Aspen what it is. And that we, um, Elizabeth Pepke one time said, you're killing the golden goose. What makes Aspen special is what makes, um, 
sister cities that I'm involved with, uh, you do a visit to sister cities and you see the, the love and the spirit of the people that uh, live in that community. It's not Barilochi as a town or Shimakapu as a little village. It's the, the love and the fabric and the spirit of that community and friendship and love. And that's what we, I think, have to set as our North Star is to preserve uh, what there is that makes Aspen and our community a community instead of a commodity. That's useful. Thank you. Thanks. Any, anybody else? Yes, Justin. I guess I'm just filled with questions about um, the, you know, why are we brought into this universe um, for this brief moment in eternity and then given a mind that's so distracted from the experience of that, that eternity, that, that, et that eternal moment? Why, why are we so drawn to flashy things and to you know, pleasures and the distraction of the moment. Why are we so distractible? Um, you know, I just, I'm contemplating that strange um, paradox of being um, given this one chance to experiencing it and having a, a, a tool to experiencing it that so, uh, needs so much refinement and effort to be quiet. I, I think that's interesting and, and I think Richard Raw's concept of the two halves of life are quite useful in that because some people never get to the second half of life. They, they stay with the flashiness all the time and they stay with the survival of the mind and they never get to the contents of it. But the willingness to, to self-reflect, which is part of our development in, in our evolution, the, 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 willing, the ability to self-respect is there for all of us. And if we grow into the second half of life, which I think everybody in this room is, has done, in, in growing into the second half of life, we then have the opportunity to make a difference to exactly what you're talking about. And it is a function of education. It is a function of saying, hey, you know, as, as Ward was saying, it is not about that, that flashiness. It is about the beating heart that, that is at the center of all things. And us reminding ourselves and reminding each other of that is what our responsibility is in life. But a quick answer is I think the reason we, we have all that is it's about survival. But we have to get beyond that survival, I think. We wouldn't have survived, I don't think, if we didn't, didn't have that. But thank you for that. Yes, of course, Mimi, yeah, of course. No problem. Well, a, a big part, I think, is um, we need to still our minds. And when our minds are still, we have the opportunity to hear those whispers. And I would disagree with Richard Orr, Orr that we have to wait till the second part of our life to um, find that quiet mind and find that inner voice because I do it with kids who are six years old. I, just to respond to that, I mean, it's not a chronologic, when he talks of that, it's not chronologically. I mean, he often talks about kids who are way into the second half of life. So it, it's not, yeah, it's not a linear thing. It, it is an <clears throat> You know, thinking of, of, of uh, Justin's comment, um, it, there's, there, there's a phenomenon that, that we are the company we keep. And we do sort of try to, you know, resonate or be in harmony w with the environment we choose. And certainly in the, the origins of the United States, it was people that came from very orthodox, sort of puritanical religious niches. They said, we, we need to get to some place where we can just hang out amongst ourselves because everything here in Holland is a disaster or something, you know. So it, it occurs to me that actually this chapel and this community is not your average person on the street in downtown Aspen. And so if, if together, you know, we're created an environment with self-selected people who are here, you know, it's a big help. Yeah, good. Uh, just, just one more thought, just to, to what Justin was saying. I, I find it helpful to think that 
um, that part of us that wants the flashy, you know, all the stuff you're talking about, that wants all of that, is not other than the part of us. That's the same, in essence, it's the same part of us that wants the divine and wants that ultimate connection and oneness. And so I loved your word refine because it's then all about just refining that innate human longing that we have and how to, how to connect. That was just my thought when you were talking. Thank you.